This is part two in our particle effects tutorial series. Today, I'm gonna to focus on just two concepts, modifiers and domains, which may sound like a group of people who meet in basements wearing furry onesies with ears and horns, but it's actually just about making these. This tutorial builds on the concepts that I went over in part one of this tutorial series, so do make sure that you're already familiar with what was covered there. Fair warning, today you will have to multiply and add. I'm sorry about that. But without math, we wouldn't have software. And without software, well, we wouldn't have photorealistic 3D games, now would we? The good news is that you've already been introduced to modifiers in part one, the curvy and the random. And I am gonna start with the most simple modifiers. After all, every aspiring particle designer needs to be able to make a falling leaf before they make their first thermonuclear bomb. If we open our glorious particle editor and right click in its asset browser to create a new particle, I'm quickly gonna create a simplified version of the smoke particle we made last time. I'm gonna set spawn rate to three particles per second, I'm gonna to go to motion physics and set gravity scale to minus two so my particles float upward and make my lifetime a bit longer, say six seconds. Lastly, I'm gonna make my particles a bit bigger by setting field size to two. Now it's time to explore modifiers. Click on this little drop down menu to the right of our field size value, and here are all of my modifiers lurking in the dark. And what do modifiers do? Wait for it. They modify the values of whatever feature to which they're attached. In this case, field size. Simple enough, but in fact, this can get very complicated. So the first modifier I'm gonna add is one we used last time, which is simply random. If you drag the random amount slider, you'll see that we can vary this between zero and two. But to what exactly? What does this value actually represent, and how is it used, and what's the secret to life? I don't know the secret to life, but the secret formula, which is not obvious by just looking at this, this number produces a range of random values, which is always from one minus this amount to one. In other words, what you're setting indirectly through this random amount is actually the basis of the minimum random value, but the maximum value is always one. So at a random amount of one, you'll get randomized numbers between zero, which is one minus one, and one. And those numbers are then multiplied times the value that you're modifying, in this case, field size, or whatever modifier you've selected. And if you watch the particles spawning, indeed, you can see their sizes ranging from a pinpoint up to their original size, but never bigger, because the maximum random value is one, and that's multiplied by the original size. It's worth pointing out that since this maximum random value of one means you can't make numbers any bigger, only smaller, your original number should be the largest value you ever want to see. Simple enough, but a bit tricky if you're just experimenting and trying to deduce what's going on. Next, if you do the math, you'll quickly see that if you set your random amount larger than one, your minimum values will start to go into negative values because it always subtracts this value from one. Now to demonstrate that, we need to modify something other than field size because negative size is kind of like piece offensive. It's a bit of an oxymoron. Uh, here are a couple of quick productivity tips. Instead of modifying this component that I've been building, let's say I wanna keep it here so if I change my mind later, I don't have to undo a zillion changes. So I'm gonna make a copy of this entire component by right clicking on this area, right beneath the component's title bar and choosing copy or control C then clicking on a blank area of my effect graph and choosing paste or control V. I bet you didn't know that. Now, I have two components that do exactly the same thing. I'm gonna change the new one, so to make my life easy, I'm gonna name each component by double clicking on the titles. I'm just gonna call this first one random size. And since I don't wanna see it for now, I'm also going to disable it by clicking its checkbox. By the way, that's not quite the same thing as merely hiding it with this little eyeball. It would still calculate and could affect other components if they're linked together. You just wouldn't see it making any particles itself. Okay, so what I wanna do with this new component is to have our particles spawn randomly to either side of the actual position of the particle emitter entity. 
For that, I need a Location Offset feature. Location Offset is a super useful way to modify the position of where particles appear. I'm going to use my old friend the 10 meter ruler with my particle emitter placed in the middle of it so you can see exactly what's happening in glorious mathematical precision. First, I'm going to disable the random field size and I'm going to set location offset to 5 meters on the x axis. And this is actually the maximum distance away from the emitter where I want particles to spawn, but I want them to appear randomly between the emitter position and plus 5 meters away on the x axis. So I need our old friend, the random modifier. However, you'll notice that we can't add modifiers to location offset values, probably because they exist in three dimensions, but we can add modifiers to the scale right here. So I'm gonna add a random modifier there, and if I set my random amount to one, you'll see that the particles spawn at a random distance between the particle emitter's position, which is a distance of zero, and up to five meters away from it in the positive x direction. Now again, a random amount of 1 generates random values between 0 and 1 and multiplies them by the original offset value of 5. So I get offset values from 0 to 5. But I would actually like to offset to both sides of the emitter's position. In other words, from negative 5 meters to plus 5 meters. So here's where those negative random multipliers come in handy. I set random value to 2 and I get a multiplier from minus 1, in other words, 1 minus 2, to plus 1. Those values are multiplied by my original offset of 5, giving me a range from minus 5 to plus 5 meters. Killing it, baby! And I'm getting one of those math headaches. I hope I still have some of that exponential ibuprofen. I did warn you we'd be adding and multiplying, though. Sorry. Here's another example. What if I also wanted to randomize the offset on the y-axis, but using a different range of values, like plus or minus 10 meters? Do I have to apply for a special permit? Should I bring cash? Are they open on weekends? Well, I can't do it with the same location offset feature, but there's a simple trick. I can add as many features as I like. So I'm going to add another location offset. Blumigo! Set my Y value to 10, add a random modifier, and again set the random amount to 2 to give me that minus 1 to plus 1 multiplier. And if I turn my spawn rate way up so my particles kind of fill out their spawn area and stop them from floating away, you can see exactly where the spawning is happening. Now, I just happen to have a 20 meter ruler right here in my pocket along the Y axis, so you can see the particles spawning exactly within this 5 by 10 meter rectangle. Particle achievement badge number two, unlocked. Now, in fact, if you explore the location features, you'll find that you can spawn particles in the shape of geometric primitives, including circles, spheres, boxes like this one, omnidirectionally, and even using a CGF mesh component if it's attached to the same entity as your particle emitter. Which is exactly how I made these lights dancing around the surface of this satellite dish. Also, I gave them cookies with a lot of sugar. So in the case of my 5 by 10 meter plane, a quicker way to do this would just be to use location box and set it to 5 by 10 by 0 meters high. Now this kind of control allows you to spawn particles with complete control over their placement like making it look like a window frame is on fire, or melting the unfortunate surface of your sworn enemy. As you'll see, you can even distribute particles along a spline path. If you pay attention, you'll see these techniques all over our game Hunt Showdown, as well as our past titles. We'll check out these other location features later on. And now we need to talk about a little something called domains. You have already been introduced to domains, you just don't know it yet because Domains are kind of shy and usually hang out in the dark corners of parties and leave early. Sad. Let's look back at the random modifier by adding it to the field size feature again. Now let's compare this random modifier to another one that we also used in part one, the curve modifier. I'm going to disable my random modifier and add a curve to the same field size feature. And you'll notice that while the random modifier simply appears as one item in the list of all available modifiers, when you choose a curve, an extra drop-down menu pops up next to it, listing 10 possible choices, starting with age. But what exactly are these things and how are they used? Well, my friends, these are domains, and a domain is simply what gives you the input values that your modifier is modifying. I've chosen a curve because it gives you this nice visual representation of the domain, which is represented by the horizontal axis of this graph. For example, the default age domain is the lifetime of the particle represented on a normalized scale from zero on the left side of this gray box 
to 1 on the far right side. So let's make this curve a little bit more interesting by letting the particles spawn at 100% of their original field size, and then shrinking them down to about 15% of their original size by the end of their age. I'm also going to make my curve a straight line by setting the tangents on each of these keyframe points to linear. Now my particles simply shrink as they age, just like the rest of us, only less wrinkly. Now age is my domain, the range over which my field size is being modified. Age is of course a time-based domain, but as you'll see, there are plenty of domains that have absolutely nothing to do with time. Now, we're not simply stuck with these domain values, otherwise they wouldn't be too useful. We can also tweak them with these two parameters, domain scale and domain bias. Mathematically, these are super simple. Domain scale is multiplied by the current domain value, and domain bias is added to it. If we look at this as a math formula, <coughs> sorry, the final result equals domain value times domain scale plus domain bias. And remember that multiplication always takes precedence over addition when you calculate the result. And that result is where we land on the horizontal axis when we're looking at a domain with a curve modifier. So let's experiment with these values a bit. I'm going to leave domain bias at zero for now so it has no effect. And if I set domain scale to 0.5, that's getting multiplied times an age is zero when a particle is spawned, giving us zero, and multiplied by our ending keyframe, which is one. 1 times 0.5 gives us 0.5. So that means that this keyframe gets shifted over to 0.5 on this horizontal axis. And as you can see, at that point on the curve, the field size has only shrunk to about 60%, which is exactly what we see our particles doing. Now what's tricky is that you need to think carefully about what values a particular domain is going to give you in order to make sense of the result. Age is always normalized from 0 to 1, but other domains will produce entirely different values, like speed in meters per second. While we're looking at curves, I also want to point out that our domain is represented on the graph by this lighter gray box. Now that gray box represents the only part of the domain in which we can modify values by setting keyframes. But if you use your scroll wheel to zoom out on this graph, you'll notice that it continues past this gray domain area. In fact, it goes on forever, or at least far enough that you'll need a large order of french fries to get you through the trip. And by the way, if you get lost in this graph, just click on the graph parameter here in your properties to automatically zoom back into the domain range. If you grab a keyframe like this first one, you'll see that you can drag it above or below the gray domain area. For example, I could drag it up to 3, which means my particles now start at 300% of the original field size. I can do the same with any keyframe. Now remember that these numbers on the vertical axis are just multiplied by the value we're modifying. However, what you can't do is put keyframes outside the domain area along the horizontal axis. And yet, if we go back to domain scale, we can actually put a huge range of values in here to plus or minus 999,999 last time I checked, and anything less than zero or greater than one is completely outside of this gray domain area. What the Moby Dick is going on here? I'm going to set domain scale to a modest value of two because 999,999 frankly scares me. And watch what happens to the particles. They still shrink all the way down to the final keyframe value. But then, they just stay that way, like they've just given up on life. And if you look closely, you'll see that they reach that final keyframe value exactly halfway through their lifetime. Now this is not mysterious, my friends. It is simple math. The domain scale of 2 has been multiplied by the starting domain value of 0 and the final value of 1. That extends our domain all the way over here to 2, even though we can't set keyframes outside of the 0 to 1 domain area. We interrupt this regularly scheduled tutorial to give you this. I just said that you cannot make keyframes outside of the main gray area here, but that's not exactly true. If you double click here, you'll see that you can make them. Wow, there's a keyframe. Wonderful. Outside of the main gray area. But the fact is, as soon as you try to move it, you'll see it for what it is. And what's happening is that it jumps to the end point, in this case. Or if I try to make one over here, it's going to jump to the start point. But it does do something that might be useful in some case, which is that it sets the held value coming into the beginning of the gray area or the held value going out of it. 
And it's kind of odd because you can end up with these keyframes on top of one another. So you have two ending keyframes or as many as you want to set. Not very useful, but you can do it. You can go crazy. Or you can also set the held value coming in as you like. But obviously it doesn't make any sense to do it more than once. You can press the delete key to delete that. So whatever our last keyframe value is, that value is just held for the rest of the domain, which is why you see the particles shrinking in half their lifetime and then just lingering there like they ran out of batteries. They're just victims of multiplication. But who isn't? In addition to setting domain scale, you can also add an offset to the horizontal axis using domain bias. Again, your domain bias value is just added to the original domain values. For example, I'm going to set my domain scale back to 1 and set domain bias to 0.5. And now my domain begins at 50% of the way through this curve when the particles have already shrunk about halfway. If I set it to minus 0.5 and zoom out a bit on the graph, you can see that the field size is holding the first keyframe's value throughout the part of the age to the left of the keyframe, and then only gets halfway through my decreasing curve before we loop back and start over. Everything is offset 50% to the left. Now the curve editor makes it easy to visualize these domains, but with other kinds of modifiers, we don't have any kind of visual. So you need to know what's going on and be able to visualize it in your head, hopefully without supplemental oxygen. I really encourage you to play around with a wide range of settings, take your time, and analyze what's happening until you're clear about why you're seeing what you're seeing. There's just one more basic modifier that I want to demonstrate, and that's linear. To set this up, I'm going to reverse the slope of my field size curve so the particles grow over their lifetime. I'm also, once again, setting the tangents on these curve points to be linear. So in the end, what I've plotted is a straight line that simply uses age, which is a number between 0 and 1, as a multiplier for field size. In other words, the particles spawn at 0 size and grow linearly to the original field size value. Well, there's nothing wrong with this approach, but given the need to optimize performance at every step of game development, it's worth asking yourself, what do you think is a more expensive formula to calculate? A straight line between two points? Or a multi-keyframe spline curve? Now, even if my curve happens to be a straight line at the moment, it's still calculating using a formula that's capable of handling a spline curve with many keyframes. And that is definitely more expensive than a straight line between two points. Since we've just plotted a simple one-to-one -one relationship between field size and age, there is a more efficient way to do this. And that's where our good friend, the linear modifier, comes in. I'm going to disable this curve, add a linear modifier, and leave age as my domain. Now all linear does is simply pass on the values from the domain, which you can then modify further with domain scale and domain bias. So if you compare these two methods, you'll see that linear gives me exactly the same results but at a much cheaper cost. One last thing about multipliers, you can and will assign many modifiers to a feature, even the same type of multiplier, multiple times. Each of them is simply multiplied by the others, so the order doesn't make any difference. And that is it for part two. In part three, we'll dive into some more complex modifiers, the meaning of life, and why all supervillains should master particle effects if they want to be respected by other supervillains.